I am going to give the microphone to David, but I'd just like to say, after Vanessa's excellent talk, if we are faced with such a horrific terrorist threat, which I do not believe is the case, but if we were to be faced with this dramatic threat, why is it that the British government is consistently cutting the British military to a stage where it no longer functions? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm so humbled to follow um, Vanessa. It begs the question, what could be the most, what is the possible motive here for this horrendous and outrageous activity, clearly by our own government are involved, our own regime, to justify what's going on there? So I'm, 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 I'm asking the question, and I'm going to submit this to you. And, and this is what my opinion is after, after some five years of being provoked into acting and doing something uh, via Admiral Sandy Woodward, who was the, the lead admiral down in the Falklands when we went to retake those islands. And despite nothing that he tried in 2010 and 2011 at Defence Committee with Major General Julian Thompson, Nothing has changed. 20, e, e, the EU, as I believe, not the strategic and defence security view that we were told by the political interface that purports to represent us, was really an EU review. Um, and the reason I think that, and this is what I've, I've come to, when you follow the money, and there's an awful lot of money involved in defence and defence industry, the two go hand in glove. You cannot consider them separate. When you follow the money, you find the policy. And this is the trail over five years that I've chiseled out. And I've met many heads of service, admirals, generals, chiefs of defence staff. I've tried to interact with many MPs, the majority of which don't want to discuss this because the party will not allow them, or the controllers of the party will not allow them to speak about it. And that includes Nigel Farage, despite the fact he gets on the stage and goes, and now they're calling for an EU army. But when I challenged him face to face, along with Roger Helmer, he ran from me. Ran. <coughs> so, I have to, well, well, maybe, I have to thank Brian, because we've been working together for quite some time now. And ladies and gentlemen, I have to submit to you the benefits of service, what we have here with Brian, and the extraordinary... <laughs> The extraordinary work that's undertaken there at the UKC and an, 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 an example to us all to go out and propagate and to challenge and shine the light on these dark corners. So, the matter at hand. This is a quote, and I, I read this quote to a former Chief of Defence Staff in the Queen's private chambers in, tower, in, in, in the Tower in London, in the city. It took me quite some time to get to him, but eventually, after a cup of tea in the House of Lords, there was a subsequent meeting arranged. And the clue's in the title. United States of Europe. Our whole concept for the unification of Europe was that it would first contribute to economic unification. Then we hoped to secure economic and military unity. And finally, political unity. Now, the gentleman that made that quote is a guy called Avril Harriman. He was chief envoy to the Marshall Plan for the alleged rebuilding of Europe after World War II. The Marshall Plan was drafted, conceived at the Bank of International Settlements during World War II and was then subsequently executed. Its first steps were to take control of coal and steel, the pillars of any nation. So, Avril Harriman was a, a very big financier in, a, in America prior to the war and was a supporter of, uh, uh, and I'm told, a supporter of Nazi Germany and a funder of Nazi Germany. His subsequent funding after the war is extraordinary, some of the things that he was involved with, but anyway. So, Britain's defense, uh, Her Majesty's Armed Services, the Crown, 
armed services. Because obviously the, the guys and girls that are in there swear allegiance to the crown, first and foremost, have been hollowed out. Many officers have used this word, hollowed out. Uh, I would submit stripped out. And first and foremost, the thing that was attacked first in Britain in 1957 was the Duncan Sandys single point purchase, clue in the title, single point purchase for defence uh, defense industry. So we homologated all of these industries that were active and productive, making timely goods, jobs, okay, families, stability, were homologated into one, which has now become BAE. At which point now, of course, the first thing they did, execute TSR2. There's a decision made, you as a nation are not going to manufacture your own aircraft. This is going to be done on a pan-European basis. So the first thing, pan-avia with a tornado, clue, European. The same as E for now, tornado. It's the European fighter for the European Air Force. Okay? So we're seeing our entire military uh, now, and the words that the, 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 that the heads of service now use are interoperability, quality, mass. Okay, interoperability means we are not able to conduct anything like we did in the Falklands by design. The policy was designed that way. So, you don't need a Royal Navy or a Royal Air Force or a British Army or Royal Marines if you're not going to be a nation because the principles at the BIS that the central bankers adhere to they only recognize the money. They don't recognize countries. They don't, as we've heard, they don't recognize religion. They certainly don't recognize, um, you know, the other fundamentals that you may do as, as, as a society or a country. They only recognize the money, the management of the money and the flow of the money. Now, why would we want military union? And this is the one word that will get an MP to run faster than Lin Linford Christie. They get very irritable when you start using this language. General Darnett didn't get irritable when I quoted him that. Now, bearing in mind he was a chief of defense staff, was unaware of that recipe. We will have our whole plan back at the BIS. First step, currency union. Tick, done that. Next vital component to get to the final strategy of political union, which we all know is a tyranny. It's unelected, it's a tyranny. It's actually a shield in front of a bank. That's what it does. That's what the EU Parliament and the commissioners provide. A shielding system, an operating system to stop anyone getting at the money. So we can gauge by this and this is the one thing that, that instantly with any party political representative, I am not going to refer to them as members of parliament. Thank you. Um, that they balk at, because the, the currency union, with the factors that we were told by Avril Harriman, that the military union is as important as the currency. So, how do we then link into, into Syria? Well, if we want an EU army, as they say, which is the colloquialism, but that's not what it is. It is military union, or as Fallon is now calling it, since I believe we've shone the light on him, defence union. So we've seen a lovely little cascade in the, in the recent weeks since this we've now brexited. Have we? No. Nothing has happened. Our military is just as entwined as it was previously. So since Brexit, we've seen Theresa May. We, I've had a hell of a lot of luck with admirals, generals, colonels, voicing, trying to voice this in the press, but they hit the same wall. The parties will not voice it. Nobody in Vote Leave wanted to talk about it. I put a 35-year government expert at the rank of admiral into Vote Leave, who is an expert in insurgency and counterinsurgency, and after 45 minutes came out after meeting Vote Leave's top brass and their management, this is what's going to happen. There will be a new leader, probably Theresa May. There will be a general election, and then they'll kick it in the stingers. So this is, was all known. I mean, Vote Leave had no intention of debating 
the vital componentry of what was actually the grand jury of our people needed to decide upon. Did they still want to have Her Majesty's Armed Services, a Navy, an Air Force, Royal Marines, so on and so forth, and all of the industry that's vital to go with it that you would have to operate as a country, like steel, coal, making your own aircraft, making a ship, making a gun, whatever. Now, I'm not favouring that, obviously, I'm not a warmonger. Please don't, please don't think that. But in terms of the engineering tree, which is my background, engineering, in terms of the engineering tree in our country, it has been obliterated. You couldn't say it's decimated. It's been obliterated under this policy for 60, 70 years. So how have we ended up with this? So from the Marshall Plan, we've got definite tactics and strategy to get to the final strategy. How has it happened? Well, this has been a steady thing over many, many years. So We've had the currency union, they did that out in, the, out in the open, they had no choice, it had to be done in out in the open, but the defence side of things, the military side of things, is all behind closed doors, not being debated, refusing to debate, debate it. And this is key, and General Dannett, bless him, said why. On the reiteration of that quote from Avril Harriman, he drew in, straightened his tie and said, it went a little bit grey I might add, the British people will not support this. General, with all due respect, the British people don't know about it. So how would they? So it is a, a sad state of affairs that where we are, but I've had a lot to do with Tory MPs, Tory ministers, and so on and so forth. So this is the reason. Their command chain within the party works more efficiently than that of a regiment or of that of a captain in a ship. Nobody's allowed to do anything without taking orders. And the key guy was Oliver Letwin. He was in charge of policy and had been for many, many years in the back, out of sight, he was more important than the Prime Minister because he told the Prime Minister what to do. The instructions, the policy, the food of a politician come from him. Thank you. He is on his declaration, on his declaration, I was just about to say, this is, this is not a secret, this is open information on the declaration. He's a non-executive director of NM Rothschild. So we go all the way through back to the bank. So, we've got to look at the reason. Okay, so why is this military union thing important? You know, it's happening. Okay, we've seen Theresa May cosy up to some of our troops just after Brexit, some nice cosy photos in front of a tank, and General Nick Carter, who's using this new speak. Immediately after that, Fallon goes to Germany and announces enhanced defence union with Germany. We are stepping towards openly military union. Immediately after that, the Commandant General of the Royal Marine Corps went to Potsdam in Germany with a group of other heads of service, and I can only assume that the EU Military Command and Control Centre in Potsdam was activated at that point. Now, I know that these Military Command and Control structures exist because I was told by the captain who built them in 2008 and 2009. I've had it confirmed by two admirals that this is the case. EU military union can be effected across the entire EU zone within one working day. Now, for then Cameron to say that there were no plans, well, that's awfully interesting because you don't go around the back of the bike shed with the big boys and smoke that are smoking unless you want to smoke with them. So to build the centres... Frankly, you know, we're right on the money with what Avril Harriman has warned us here. You know, this is very real. So the finance side of stuff, it gives, it gives weight to the balance. Actually, what's the important factors here? Military union is as important as the currency itself. So the driver here, I believe, with Syria, was, it, was the mitigation, the leverage to argue for military union in the EU zone. Now, I know there's something rotten here, because when I met with Lord Tebbit over a cup of tea in the Lords, he told me immediately after the Falklands, Jack Delors asked Maggie Thatcher for military union. And she said, and this is the interesting bit, no, no, no. Now when she alluded to that in the, in the subsequent speeches, the military union part had been, you're going to have to shut up, don't tell anyone about that. That's far too much of a hot potato. We've just done the Falklands, but the rot had set in. Vulcan, chopped. Hermes, chopped. Harrier, 
legalized then by major, we couldn't even build one. So, ladies and gentlemen, business is war. And the war has been waged for quite some time. On paper, since 57, we've hemorrhaged our industry, which is the vital part. It's hand in glove with the hard edge of actually the guys and girls at the front. So without that, there is no hope. And the primary factor that I started to argue with on a logical basis with these MPs to start with, sorry, party representatives, was that this is ridiculous. How can you say that, that you know, you're saying that Putin is this horrendous creature and we're in all this danger, and yet you cut, and you cut, and you cut, and you keep cutting, and now we cannot operate openly. You've had Admiral say it. Reality check. So the reason is, of course, is they want military union because it supports the currency. And this was the one thing that uh, I wish we had more like him. You may not agree entirely with his politics. Um, fine. But the single point budget that was required for the EU required budgetary control. So military union is actually budgetary control across the board. They will get to decide where that money is spent, on what. And that is the primary thing because it supports the euro. So military union actually props up the euro, which we know is just pretend money. It's just printed from the BIS through the ECB. Every single migrant that comes into the EU zone, they instantly issue an order to print another 6,000 euros. So that is, that is the, the stakes that we're working at. So all this money, the EU are now going to go shopping. Frederica Mogherini, their de defense minister, she's a fellow of the Marshall Plan. Can you see how that tracks straight back into HQ? So the money here is the key. It's the money what it's all about. And I fear that with Trump, what Trump is going to do, despite all his other rhetoric, what it appears is he's already saying, you know, he's already declared 18 months ago, we're going to cut NATO. He declared it openly. Too many of our politicians have hung their hat on NATO. A lot of our generals and, and people that have articulated will hang on to NATO. NATO was already dead because like the Sajid Ga Javid Gaff that I witnessed on defense forces for Britain. So he knew, a reiteration from his circle. He knows nothing of the subject matter. He just reiterated what he'd heard from the group he was in. The same as Trump. He must have reiterated from within his circle that NATO, the decision to stop NATO. NATO is only a bus to EU military union, and it's going to stop very quickly. And at the point it stops, the EU will then flow that money, the money will flow around, will not see any of it because everything's been stripped out of this country. Maybe the sweeping's off the floor. I think the, the, the dynamic with the, the F-35 is 15% goes to BEA, uh, BAE. So you're going to end up, that money's going to go around. There's only so many places they can spend this money. At some stage, it's going to stick in one of those companies. It's going to pull, and then what's going to happen is we will lose BAE. And then that's it. Unless the challenging starts now because these party representatives do not want to talk about this. They know it's an election killer. They would not sustain this aired properly in a general election, and that is why they won't do it, because they are all complicit, and they have been for so many years. They're either inept, negligent, whatever. Now, I'm good, on, the, on the title of the sheet here, it mentions the word treason. So I've got to say you know, that I'm submitting it to you as the grand jury. One man's treaty is another man's treason. And I, I cannot see that this is in the best interest of the nation for us to effectively surrender budgetary control, policy control, procurement control, capital budget, operational budget of our, of our military. Because that is what is effectively is going to happen. So they're saying we're Brexiting. Not while we are intertwined with the EU. It cannot, because this is a fundamental component of ultimately getting to political union. So, what I would ideally like you to do, one of the main architects of this was Sir Gerald Howarth. We've had some difficult decisions to make when he cut through the bone. And this is what I've seen going in and out of Parliament many, many, many times. And I've met MPs, ministers, ex-ministers, and they're all about as much use as a lukewarm bucket of water. They perpetrate on the one hand and condemn on the other, while the main body of control continues on. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are so perilously close to losing our own military, I cannot emphasize that to you enough. 
it is vitally important that this is challenged. And at some stage during this week, would you all be good enough to send Sir Gerald Howarth a tweet amongst your net? Recruit as many people as you can during next week. Send him a tweet. Are we about to go into EU military union? Just a simple question. And I hope that most of you here will be able to recruit a lot of people around to actually maybe, maybe send him four, five, six hundred tweets. Okay, it works. Because believe you me, I challenged him on Twitter about the EU C3s. One in Northwood, where there's 100 EU staff in our own HQ. EU staff. There's one in Paris and there's one in Greece. He denied he knew anything about it. Two days later, he put on his Twitter that he and William Hague stopped them being made the previous time round. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much.